Hello, I am absolutely, absolutely just giddy about interviewing Nancy Muscatello tonight. Um, let me find her here. So if you have not yet been listening to the podcast Scamanda, there's a good chance you're living under a rock because it's been the number one podcast on iTunes. Um, oh, and she's here now. Let me get her right in here right now. Go live. She's joining from. I'm so excited. So Nancy Muscatello is the executive producer. Ah! <laughs> we did it. I did, did it. I can push a button. <laughs> it's more complicated than that, Nancy. Admit it. <laughs> All right, so I don't, I didn't, um, ahead of time, how much time do you have tonight? Is there like a number you want to stick below? No, yeah, I don't know. Let's see how it goes for about a half hour or so, or so, whatever you, whatever you need. It's um, good. All right, well, we have a lot of questions we will crank through, but first and foremost, I want you to give a little bit of background about your professional background and how you came to know about Scammy Amanda. <laughs> so I have been, um, a television producer or investigative producer uh, in uh, news and uh, true crime since the early 90s. So I started with a TV show called Hard Copy, which in its heyday was Hard Copy, A Current Affair, Inside Edition. Um, I uh, learned and trained on the, the news desk there. And in it, within a couple of years, I ran the news desk for then about six or seven years. So I covered everything from uh, starting with the Menendez brothers when they, their trial started, not when they actually um, were committed the, the crime. And then O.J. Simpson, Amy Fisher, uh, Michael Jackson was a big one I covered. Um, you know, running a news desk, you're constantly, and we were a daily show, so we were, you know, up and running every day and, and working on those cases and going to their trials and covering it. And I always work behind the scenes. I'm the one prepping, researching, and getting everything ready for the cases or stories that then a reporter would then report on. Or we would send producers to then go do all the interviews and, and do stuff. And then on some cases, depending on the booking, like um, I, I would go for certain ones, you know, depending on the, the case or the story and how big it was. Okay, because that was one of my questions originally. I remember because you my mom had told me at the time that you connected with her. She was the principal at Valley. And, um, and then, you know, years later, I heard of this podcast and Charlie and I was like, who's this Charlie girl? This is a Nancy <laughs> story. Um, so that's not, you're not usually the person who's like no. actively reporting. Correct? No, I, 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 that is not me. And this is, this is a, a, it's not that it's uncomfortable. It's just not, I'm not a in front of the camera type of person. I, um, my all my work is done behind the scenes and, and there's a lot of work it's a team that's behind the scenes to get what you finally got you see on television and um, so and it depends sometimes of, you know you're deemed an investigative producer if you're doing cold cases if you're doing you know true crime that's happening like you know in the case of, of OJ Simpson we broke so many things on that but we were a daily news show so that's how that worked I, so I'm not a writer I'm, like, I'm not a I'm not a reporter like for a newspaper I think there you know some people aren't sure about that um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm behind the scenes and I prep what you're going to see and, and who's going to cover it. And I, running a news desk or running that type of thing is um, the last show that I was on for the, when um, uh, Amanda came across my desk was um, Crime Watch Daily, which was a national syndicated show uh, five nights a week. And so we were, you know, we did hundreds of cases in the four years that we were on or three, three to four years. Yeah. I have like so many questions for you i would love to talk to you right now about chris hansen but i'm going to um a lot of yeah a lot of fun to work with chris is yeah um i love chris hansen as does my family we're obsessed with chris mm -hmm. um but so basically important distinction you are a member of the press but you're not a journalist you're a television yeah, producer so in producer. television production yeah you're you're the journalist is the one who's usually on camera right um but a lot of the times the stuff that they're working on, it, it, it's a little different on national as opposed to local. Local news, a reporter will be writing, producing, you know, sometimes working, the camp, doing it all. Um, when, when you're on a, a national 
show. It's, you know, it's a, a larger situation. So you have multiple field producers. You have different levels of people that, that it takes to do a, a larger show. All right, let's just bite in. So juicy. Let's get to it. Um, so you, can you talk a little bit about how you came to be aware of um, Samantha? Yeah, so Amanda came across my radar um, via a Facebook group that I posted in about, we were just starting out our show for Crime Watch. It was not launched yet. And so we were looking for different types of cases. You know, we were a daily, gonna be a daily, nightly show. Um, and we really wanted to tackle scammers or, or that type of thing. And, and it's not easy to do. And so um, that's always been one of the things for all these years, 30 plus years I've been doing it. Those stories are usually really hard to, to harness and do. And so we, I started fairly early, like just kind of putting feelers out and, and looking for cases that maybe we could, could look at and see if it could be done for the show. And so it, with those postings is how someone found me. Got it. And then, okay, I'm just going to go through the questions yeah, that ahead. were submitted to me and a little bit of background about myself. I'm an oncology nurse. I work at one of the places that Amanda claimed to have received chemotherapy as um, you yeah. and I have discussed previously through screenshots that she had sent uh, friends. Yes, I wish I knew you before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that would have been really I helpful. I could have walked you through the Keytruda <laughs> situation. Um, but yes, yeah, so it, it hits very close to home for me as I'm an oncology nurse. I work at one of yeah. the places where she quite received chemotherapy. And my mom was the principal at Valley where she worked as a teacher. And my husband actually went to orientation through her. And I remember him coming home and saying, oh, I met the nicest woman today. On, like, she has cancer and I told her about you. And so I think you guys should connect. You know, she wanted to meet you. And I was like, Oh, great. I'm always happy to help people who have sure. cancer, you know, questions, help them navigate. Um, but I never heard from her. And I feel like I specifically, she would like avoid me. And I was always kind of confused about that. But now it, now it, makes, it makes sense. sense right? Yes. So do you have, you know, have you heard anything? I know you are on Nancy Grace and there was a psychologist on the show as well. Like Munchausen's is now called factitious disorder. Mm -hmm. Does she have that? Is she a psychopath? Is she a narcissist? <laughs> like, what have you heard? What do you think? Well, you know, again, you, I'm hearing from people after the fact, people that, you know, are, are listening to the podcast and trying to, you know, grasp that and diagnose that as anything like, you know, it would be unfair to, to categorize it. There are definitely, you know, some characteristics or some um, uh, traits that you would, you know, could fit into a, several of those. I've just recently been reading a little bit more about uh, the term malingering and, and that type of thing, which um, to me rings a trait that rings so true. Um, you know, I'm sure in, the, I'm hoping in the facility she's in that that's something that they're dealing with and trying to, you know, diagnose and, and hopefully help treat in some capacity. I mean, I, I don't know enough about it to know. I know a lot of those things aren't like fixable in a sense, but you, you there's a way to help um, curb the, uh, I guess, it's, however they're acting. The is, do you believe that she knew what she was doing is wrong? Ah, absolutely, absolutely. She had so many off ramps along the way. Um, it, you know, you 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 can scam and you can take money and you can do that and you can kind of go on your way or kind of keep a low profile um that wasn't it with her and 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 anything that popped up to where someone may be caution and say like oh oh wow someone's figuring this out like that it, nothing dissuaded her and i think you make a real deliberate because there was always an ask for a money it was never just oh i have this it was always like oh but can you help with that or I need help with this. And there was always an ask. And I think that's what differentiates her from maybe someone that wasn't, you know, is I'm asking. coming over my, I'm interrupting my own thoughts. Like, <laughs> because there's so much there. Yeah. Um, yes. And I looked up factitious disorder. You need, it's not, it's not for a particular gain. It's just yeah. that you feel that you're ill. So she clearly had a gain that she was going for. Um, and, and I talked a little bit about. And she, and she had a gain from you know from even college days because that's kind of what we where we go back to you know it was always 
the behavior or the issue that she had, then, you know, she got off of duty. She didn't have to work. She had special treatment in classes. Like there was things that, um, there was always a something in return. Yeah. Yes. And I have to say that it was genius. Her whole scam was freaking brilliant because nobody could ever, you know, nobody can look at her medical records. And even if you could, if you were treating her, then you can't say that yeah. you looked at her medical records because then you would lose your license. So it, she had everyone by the short hairs. It was a very, very good lie. And it would, and she was able to use it for so many different things. Like she wants to travel to New York. She needs to go into a clinical trial. She wants to get pregnant. She's in remission. Like whatever yeah. she wanted and needed, she could just make that it, happen. She was, want to go to work, you know, she's in the hospital. It's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she, originally it was, I need this clinical trial and it's only in Canada. That was at one point, like she had Stanford in her backyard, right? So there's no better care. But I and, but somehow. Say, for all the people that were duped, like at one point, my mom showed me all her blogs and mm -hmm. like stop, like we were looking at it. I'm an oncology nurse and I have the wherewithal to know that people are thinking she's faking it at this point and I'm looking at it and I could never have told you 100% she's faking it. Like I was like, oh, she shaved her hair and I can see that all the hair growing in is thick and like it's all, it does, yeah. it's not thin or packed it all looks uniform and I was like that's interesting you know or she said she was calling it a port but it looked like it was like a zeo patch for heart monitoring right. and I'm like well why is she calling it that um but I could you know like it's quite a something to say that person is faking cancer like you'd be a real you know that's a tough thing to say um so yeah I just... for for her um you know I had knowledge from my original source that was always in the back of my head um and so from that information i you know i knew something wasn't right and then it was really in the details that she gave um because the details when you when i had uh someone that specialized in uh clinical trials and, and on oncology she's a um like an advocate for patients it was mm -hmm. someone i knew for years someone that helped with my my own sister giving me advice and helping us navigate her cancer um i had that person take a real hard look at it. And then she gave me a list of things, you know, to, to really focus on, like, you know, you can, you can check the combination of the drugs. You can check what's, what the clinical trial is about. There's, there's very specific things that she got wrong. There was some procedural things she got wrong in the sense of like, you know, the stem cell transplant and, you know, the pregnancy, you know, like reversing the, like Honestly, there, there was, though i have to say i had a patient with lymphoma who was pregnant and i had to coordinate her care so that she her chemo ended at a certain time and she delivered at a certain time like it's possible to have lymphoma yeah, it, it's absolutely it's absolutely possible but you know on her blog she you know and what she discussed was she not only was going through chemo but she also had an iud and the baby Baby was late and full term. You know, like there was a lot of how that happened, right? You know. Yes. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's crank through these. I happily haven't gone through any more questions <laughs> yet because I was like, I have so much to say, and you have so much to say, and I like just want to take your brain. Um, okay. What did she spend the money on? What, what was she spending it on? Lifestyle. I mean, there was never anything. I mean. I know, you know, Corey got a truck or she got a different vehicle, but when, when their scam went 2012, by 2013, they claimed bankruptcy, right? So that was um, really monitored by the courts of the spending and they had to get permission to spend and they had to get permission to do things. So there was, you know, eyes on, on that in, in, a, in, in a way. And so any vehicles they bought or things, so, um, a lot of handbags, a lot of clothing. Um, she was very well put together. Uh, a lot of hair, you know, extensions and things when it came back. Like there was a lot of, I think just daily living. There was never huge, ex there was vacations, there was trips, but a lot of that people paid for for them. A lot of that was donated. That was, so it was, was like, and it, it wasn't <laughs> like, li it wasn't, when I say living expenses, it wasn't, it was above and beyond living expenses, right? It was all the, you know, getting your nails done, buying a lot of designer purses, like it was that type of stuff. Got it. So like, you know, luxury lifestyle above. Yeah, yeah, but crazy. nothing super crazy. Because again, they were, 
they were under uh, bankruptcy and being okay. watched for that. Can we so, get into like, like drugs a little bit? Because you mentioned the the picture, she posts a picture, this, mm -hmm. they talk, you talk about this on the podcast, and she has in her hand a bottle and on Reddit, they've figured out that that prescription bottle has the name Kevin on it. And so yeah, yeah, that was something her. we noted way back. And, and yeah, she would post things. And um, when you could take a better look, yeah, the name Kevin was on there. That, that was one of the things we're like, who, wait, what? <laughs> and then you could also see the different, um, uh, what is it, milligrams? and stuff in it what that drug would be and um it was like a narco drug yeah. so you know she was very careful about placing drugs and showing drugs that you couldn't necessarily see what they were um but looked into things i would have sources that would contact me and um I, it was much later that i learned that she was also probably you know shopping for some you know painkillers and different things but that came much later that was not I'm gonna turn entirely really quick. Is that with the Texas ER? Is that what she kind of got busted for? Was they were thinking she was like yeah. drug seeking? Yeah, my, my understanding was that, that was what kind of cued them in. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that helped, but it's like I'm losing the oh. light up here a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so and that was what Officer Martinez was talking about that that he specifically knew he was going to find that in the search and he did find like benzos and right. Um, yeah. And that, that was so so you know, like when they did that search, um, I wasn't privy to any of that, um, that information and stuff. So if that's what they were going in looking for that, then I do know that you know, the process with if, that um, Special Agent Lee would have taken is um, they have to, in order to get a search warrant, they go in front of a judge, they have to present their probable cause, they have to present what they're looking, what they expect to find, what they know they're going to find. Mm -hmm. By then, you know, you, you know, all medical records have been subpoenaed and she doesn't know any of that's going on. So this is all done behind the scenes. So they're going in knowing what, what they want to, what they should find and what they need to take. I mean, and, and being there and seeing stuff come out, you know, the, you, they had boxes and boxes and computer, like things, you know, they knew what they would probably be going in for. Okay. Speaking of that um, and what they found, like, why isn't Corey in prison? Obviously, the money went to their joint bank account. At one point, they talk about him getting a new truck. Like, how is he not in prison right now? Well, I mean, for all the law, you know, he testified under oath for bankruptcy court family, you know, family court, um, my court case, and, um, you know, he perjured himself many times with that once she was indicted, right? You look back and you say, okay, in my court case, he testified that he went to all her chemo treatments and he went to all her doctors. So, you know, how are you doing that when that doesn't exist? Um, so, yeah, I mean, are there things that I think, I think part of it, how I usually explained it, um, you know, they go for the main, the main target, um, and, you know, they, they, the feds will not take it or take someone to court or go above and beyond unless they, they feel they have an 100 percent case or not, you know, whatever. And I think with with Corey, um, there are still some things that they can look at and that they may be looking at behind the scenes, you know, I, I, but there's definitely things there and especially civilly. I mean, what he did to Alita in court. Um, it, Civilly, you know, that's something that I, I know Alita has has looked at and struggled with because she just wants to be done with it. But um, yeah, no, you know, I'm Keep going. I, with in, in that family court, eventually, uh, Alita's attorney was able to subpoena all of his pay stubs that he, you know, from his workplaces that he had been submitting all along all those years, um, and they everything he submitted was fake. So uh, he lied about it his income, he lied. And at that point, you know, that's a, you know, Alita went to the family court and her attorney and said, Hey, this, here we go. And, um, that was much later. And the family court was like, Oh, well, you should get a forensic account. Like you should go and fight this, but there's no help. And that's what's, I think, you know, just very exhausting and very tiring. And, but like um, really phone him testifying in court that he sat with her and held her hand during chemo and then having the medical records saying he did not, do that because she never got chemo like how is why yeah. isn't he just in trouble for that 
Yeah, I mean, it has to meet a certain criteria for, at least for the feds, you know, maybe on the state level, there's something they can do, you know, it's hard to say. I, I know it's infuriating and it's frustrating and it, and I, I see it when when people talk to me about it, but um, I, I do well, think they're well aware. Having to defend the feds, you know, and then, yeah, yeah, but like, it, it, I'm not so frustrated. This is your like watching him this, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for uh, the original counts on Amanda, um, the, the, there was two counts because there was wire fraud and then a, another fraud with bankruptcy court. So they actually charged her for lying in bankruptcy court. Um, and then when they when she pled out, um, they dropped that. Um, so I don't know because if that was dropped, maybe that was dropped what they could have gone. Because they, if they could go after her for that, they could obviously go after Corey for that as well. Yes. So, Okay. And maybe they're still, maybe they're still doing it. You know, I, I, I don't know. That's not, they, they don't tell you. <laughs> they're not feeling so. And on their, like, what they're doing. Yeah. Do you think they're going to stay married? Um, I know they, at, at, you know, from what I hear, they, they still are. Um, I do find it interesting that at sentencing, you know, um, the parent, the, the only people that showed up were her parents and Corey for the sentencing. Each hearing, she actually had, she had to come in for the change of plea. Before that, everything was on Zoom because it was during the pandemic. But she came for the change of plea to guilty alone. Um, when she came for the sentencing, it was just Corey and her parents. And her parents and one of her brothers um, wrote letters of support, you know. Um, but Corey said nothing in court and, and submitted no statement, which is surprising. Surprising. <laughs> you would think if you didn't know anything about it, you would be, you know, really trying to state, you know, how you'd help your wife, right, or whatever. Um, but yeah, he he didn't submit anything. Interesting. Um, and do you think they're you think they're gonna? I think that Corey should stay stay married to her. He has every interest to because otherwise, she could testify against him. And so, like, no. I think for both. And they would want to stay very much married to each other for that reason alone. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's not a perfect scenario. And maybe there's some like, hey, you know, if they were to divorce, he, you know, he would have to support her. And, pay, you know, there's things that happen with something like that. And, you know. Do you think that was the main reason why she tried so hard to get Jessa was because they didn't want to pay um, any kind of money to Alita or were they just evil? I'm sure like that's a big part of it, but I also with knowing how she operates, it's a seek and destroy type of thing. And um, I've seen with others I've spoken to, she she wanted that life. She wanted what Alita had um, and nothing was going to stop that. And that was, you know, taking her daughter. And the, and the, the plus to that was it diminished, you know, the the child payments or support or anything they had to do with that um that was a repetitive behavior um i met people later on that she it was almost like that um you know uh, what is that uh basic so like she they she focused on certain women um and came across someone that was a teacher later on that she would come in dressed like her haircut like her like if that woman said Oh yeah, we were looking at houses, but my husband and I have been looking to buy. Oh yeah, me too. Oh yeah, me too. Like it, it's a very bizarre um, pattern of of that. Have you seen the <laughs> man that rocks the cradle? Mm, yeah, like yeah. It's so bad. Yes, it, it's it was a, a a pretty horrific thing. To the the woman was very alarmed by the behavior, and and it, there's several others too that I, I've talked to over the years that they were like. Yeah, it was the strangest thing. Like she would mimic or want or want to be like. She talked about that. Lisa Berry talked about that a little bit. How she said it was such a specific book that was not popular. Yeah. Manners matter. I love yeah. her. How she pronounces that. <laughs> At and least. Yes. I love Lisa. I love Lisa Berry. She was my favorite person that you interviewed. She was just like I was eating out of she the palm of her hand. Is <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yes. And just you can see how. Amanda well, and you have to you have to correct. understand, like, after all that, you know, her and her husband went through and then 
as things progressed, I mean, um, I know because I, I know Lisa well, and I've talked to her over the years, you know, Lisa, um, Lisa went in front of the grand jury like this, this was not a, you know, an, an agent just doesn't say, Oh, I think this is what's going on. There is a process. There are, there are judges you go in front of, um, they go in front of, you know, a secret grand jury, right? And they parade people in and then the grand jury asks questions and then the agents or the prosecutor, US attorneys bring more people in. Um, and, you know, Lisa was really key to that situation because of her experience to the two years prior. Um, and so it was, it was a big deal. And, and, you know, they had to go, you know, going in front of a grand jury is scary. It's, a, it's not an easy thing. Yes. And you, you mentioned it a little bit, but okay. Amanda's mom, Peggy, I don't have a picture or even have any kind of like much idea about her. I know that Rebecca Kafiro said, Peggy told me she was, went to chemotherapy with Amanda. I have Peggy's, you know, original blog post in my mind of, cancer how dare you take yeah. my precious baby daughter from me that she was buying a vacation home in lake arrowhead and she was listed on the victims list for donating ten dollars to amanda's gofundme well um so so I think I, uh, you know. know goddess is how she liked to be called right goddess um oh, instead of grandma is yeah. that right goddess <laughs> yeah goddess was she had her i guess her kids and grandchildren and everything they called her goddess um and you know yeah, Rebecca provided us, you know, the some voicemails back and forth and, and text messages and where Peggy tells her, yeah, you know, this is crazy. It's all this, it's all this reporter and the ex-wife and I've been to the chemo appointments with her. Like, so and a, a little backstory with that is when the um, search warrant was served, which was like September 2016, um, after that, I, I was I, I was able to um, witness that and, and saw that. And then, you know, within a couple of days later, I had messaged the brothers because they were running the Support Amanda site. And yeah. so I reached out and I, you know, and again, I had reached out twice to them over, at, that's it, over the years. And I said, hey, I know I reached out to you not long ago when they opened the investigation, um, but I'd like to answer, can you answer these questions for me? Which was basically, where is the money going? How is it handled? Does it go straight to her? Like that type of stuff. You guys run it, you have on here, reach out to us if you have questions. Um, so I reached out with questions. And then in 2016, and then, so that, then my case came up in 2017 when she took me to court. And Amanda presented those emails that I sent to her brothers. And on them, the brothers had forwarded them to the mom and dad, Peggy, uh, Goddess and Tom, and with just just the writing on it that just said, what the F, you know, like, who, you know, what is this? So I know- Wait, forwarded your email to Goddess and her and, husband and said, what- And Amanda, I just said, what the F? Like, oh. questioning why am I getting, why are we getting this? So I know, and that was dated September, like, whatever. 17th of you know 27 uh 2016. 2016 so they were aware they that at least i know at that point they knew who i was they knew they were, i'm telling them the federal agents i just witnessed federal agents at the home so at that point they knew there was something going on and she was not you know indicted until 2020. so there's four years of them maybe they should have could have been keeping their eyes open or you know paying attention i would imagine because it, it, that it, that's a very <laughs> um huge, huge allegation that i'm putting out there and saying there's federal agents not you know coming with a battering ram at your door you know at the door so i would i would think that that would pique their their you know questions <laughs> so i know they were aware you know, and, and I also know, you know, she traveled to New York eight times alone. She, no one ever went with her. I, yeah, did she, she would go alone. Eight, wait, but eight, eight she had people pay eight for her and the, I know she yeah. was first class, but either way, yeah. eight times yeah. she had people pay for her flights. And okay, did she actually use American Cancer Society Hope House? Do you know if she actually used the resources that were so, for patients? Um, she, I mean, she, she, yes. Well, I shouldn't say that. She blogged that she did. The first visit to New York, she thanked them for letting her stay there. Again, with Amanda, everything is smoke and mirrors. So I don't know 
did she physically stay there or not? Um, but she she represented in the blog that that was where she stayed. She went to the young adults uh, cancer conference in New York. Um, her brother, one of her brothers, lives in Manhattan. And my understanding from the blog is that's who she she also stayed between the uh, American Cancer, the Hope House, and with the brother in some capacity. Um, I do know that after that first visit, there was a, a estrangement with the brother and she never stayed with him again. And never he never showed up in any pictures with her again while she was out gallivanting around New York. Um, then she ended up staying with a very good friend of Rebecca Kafiro's each time. Can and I just so, say, I want a BFF like Rebecca Kafiro. <laughs> oh, he. Oh yeah, my. he's extremely generous and a, a wonderful, kind-hearted person that um, she had had um, a, a longtime boyfriend that died from cancer at the time. And so that's why she attached so deeply. Um, I believe, you know, her, her current husband also had a, a, a you know at a younger age had it so she you know she really felt for her and really you know she knew Peggy very very well and that's what Amanda really capitalized on was everyone's having these relationships with people who love somebody who had cancer had passed from cancer and uh, maybe I'll just ask you this question now about what you thought her most outrageous oh, I, or, I, like, I see a question her pro brother probably knew she was full of it uh, I do believe that that one particular brother um, voiced, from what I heard through some sources, did not, things did not, not add up for to him, I think, and that's where that estrangement is still to this day. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell us about what you think her most haunting. I'm going to try to move inside for better lighting, but share your, what you think the worst thing that she did. <laughs> There's a lot, I, I, you know, um, well, the, first and foremost, you know, what she did to Jessa and Alita is horrific. I mean, taking someone's daughter away and manipulating that situation is by far the biggest, you know, uh, horrific thing that you can do. And, and they will never get that, that time back. And it took a lot of healing and a lot of... It, it, that's first and foremost probably the most horrific thing. But um, in the in the, the indictment, one of the things one of the folks that came forward, um, and and the 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 assistant U.S. attorney felt it really important to put in the actual charging documents um, was the fact that she attended um, cancer support groups uh, in the area, and one of them she had been going to for some time, and the the gentleman that runs that um, gave a statement, but and, and they pulled from the statement in the charging documents. And basically, there was another member of that group who um, was, you know, was dying from cancer. And the the last weekend of his life, he um, Amanda sought him out for her to for him to mentor and help her with what she was dealing with. Took him away from his family. He was with her for. I believe it was four or five hours and then he passed away the next day. So it's revolting that she would have the audacity to do something like that and take someone away those precious hours from, from a family. And so that person, um, that, that group wrote to the judge and explained that. And then the U S attorney pulled some like snippets out of that. So to me that, you know, the, 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 uh, horror that Alita suffered through and Jessa, I mean, being raised in that, you know, constantly being told, you know, I'm going to die. You may have to donate, you know, stem cell. You may have, you know, take it. It's just, it's abuse. It's child abuse. So I don't what think you, you can get What you just said about the stem cells is a perfect example of like, she didn't need to do that. That was Correct. extra. There's, yeah. you know, and I, I mean, I think brazen is just the word that comes to mind with her, like disgustingly rotten and brazen um uh, with so many things that she did but that extra thing like yeah emotional why, why, terrorism why do you have to do that did. to a child and it's it's, a, it's taking the mother you know manipulating to get the mother away and then on top of it like this just as a young girl a lived in fear of someone she's known all her life dying at any moment you know and being told that i have months to live i have that you know and then on top of it you know yeah and you 
may need to help. So some, I heard and think some about students... that. This is a step door. This, this, there's no DNA, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no stem cells that's gonna, you know, like, and I, I don't know. think, you know, yeah, there, but there's just that extra, like, above yeah. the scam that, that you guys talk about, like, naming it, why it was hard, because it's so much more than a scam. But I had heard that with her students, uh, like, at Valley, that she would sit with them and tell them, I'm so afraid I won't get to see my kids grow up. I, you know, I won't be able to see my kids get married. I'm so afraid of dying. Yeah. And she, like, mentored kids whose parents had cancer. Like, it, it was just almost like she got pleasure yeah. or she mm -hmm. definitely received a large reward personally from like terrifying children about cancer and like yeah that that's not that's like and you talk about on the podcast you're like oh if officer martinez like cornered me and said you know i need your medical records or like like basically the, the jig is up we know you don't have cancer but she almost, she doubles down. She like gives this, and I will say that follow my health that she gives that, mm -hmm. that he talks about is patient populated. I didn't know what that was. And it yeah. is clever because like Stanford and Kaiser use uh, my health right. online. So right. I looked at it, I looked at it. I saw the document and I looked at it and I was like, I don't know what this is. It doesn't look right, but it like is medical. Yeah, and you, just, it has, you just plug in the information or, or yeah. I mean, in fact, that, that was part of my court case too. the stuff that we had to to prove I didn't do it was, you know, um, that was one of the things that um, our, my my attorney had me self populate exactly what she self populated on on the app so that we could show like, this is oh real. Gosh. I just did the same thing. This is how easy it is. Um, you know, that's, that's it. And, and Another thing, like you were you were saying earlier about um, doubling down or what you know, this could have all went away when she sued me and took me to court. Um, we we had to mediate because that's how you handle it. It's a civil harassment suit. Um, the, it was also a, a First Amendment issue because as a member of the media and the press. Um, it, that's how this the the hearing was being handled. So uh, there was a lot on the on the line or a precedent setting that if if I was restrained, that would be you know a big issue. So um, we you have to go through mediation, which we did. We had a two day mediation um, where all she had to do was show she had cancer in some capacity to the judge to someone through via her attorney, via whatever, and that that never happened. So wouldn't you do that? <laughs> if you had cancer, you would you would say, here you go, like talk to this doc, talk, you know, this will go away and I would be restrained, right? I, I, hands down, that would have been that, but that never happened. But even if, even if she didn't have cancer at that point she could have just said okay like i can't prove this i'm just gonna drop the case against nancy and be in remission and mm -hmm. continue on my life but she did not she you know ended up at, i think at that that's maybe in the timeline where then miss cindy has cancer and then she needs half the money from yeah. the fundraiser yeah yes um so wild okay what is um any news from Amanda in prison? Is she, I heard something that she might be home on the weekend. No. And is no, she no, getting no, no, less no. time than five years? Or is yeah. she going to so, so, you know, federal, federal prison, um, it wasn't too long ago that if you, when you got, you know, your sentence, like, like she got 60 months. Federal prison, you, you, you used to serve 60 months. There's no early release. There's no anything. That has changed in the last few years where you can earn credits and there's you take classes and there's things that you do so um out of the 60 months um she had it was i think the original release date was like four years and so many months or let's say two or three months something like that um she must be doing because it comes out that it, it kind of gets out of the hands of anything for like the u.s attorney and it's the bureau of prison so she must be completing you know drug addiction courses or classes that help reduce you know as as ref, you know as you're being reformed and taking classes that are supposed to help you can get you know a reduction so that's that's new 
who are in the system and and you know and for a lot of people and, and it's, it's a it's a great thing if you're if you're bettering yourself and that's the goal right um I, you know she can be t- I, I i personally my opinion is that pathological lying and that what she does um classes are not going to f- to fix but that's you know if she's doing what she's supposed to be doing to get that reduction then that's what she's doing but um yeah they just don't give you a reduction i'm sure she's she's earning that in some capacity right you t- you said it perfectly when you said Like if officer Martinez came to me and basically said, we know you're faking cancer, I would stop. Like, I'm (laughs) okay. I've been caught. This is too risky. I don't want to go to jail. The police are asking me, like, I'm going to stop. But she's like marching into the police station and here are my fake medical records that he can totally figure that out. So someone just Um, confessed at any point has she confessed. So when she changed her plea, right, she pled not guilty. Um, when she changed her plea to guilty, it's very boilerplate. So I was in court for that. And the judge reads a whole long list, you know, asking, are you of sound mind? Are you on, you you know, making sure she knows what she's talking about. Do you just answer yes, yes, yes. Do you know you're being charged with this? Do you know that, you know, um, and do you freely, uh, agree with these charges? And basically, you know, she, she never had to stand up and say, I don't have cancer. I, this was a for like, there's no, no, there's none of that. It's admitting that you're by changing your plea to guilty, you're, you're admitting, but you know, no, there is no standing up and just saying it. Now she had the opportunity to make a statement to the judge, even then with the change of plea, like, you know, I realize what I did, you know, whatever you wanted to say. Um, but she chose not to. Uh, my sister said, are you surprised she didn't do an Alfred plea, which I don't know what that means. Uh, an Alfred plea, though, comes, you would milk guilt, but then then you don't get the time or they read, I, 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 I know what it is. I know, I mean, they, what, they didn't offer that. I mean, that has to be offered from the U.S. attorney. Wow. Um, yeah, they, they were not looking f- for, the, for the IRS and the U.S. attorney. This, this was a first case of its kind, and I think they thought it was important enough that um, with the age we live in now and the amount of fraud or GoFundMe and things that are out there, um, I think they they must have felt it was important to set a precedent or have a a roadmap, so to speak, you know, with the case because I do think uh, it's fairly easy to set up a GoFundMe and collect money, you know. Uh, and so. you and I spoke about this a little bit earlier. So I, I, one of my burning questions was like why didn't your so you were employed at the time and they mm-hmm. hired your lawyers to represent you as she's um trying to get a restraining order against you and part of what the judge ruled was that she needed to pay for your le- yes. uh, legal fees but you yes. had said that that you guys did not make her pay for those so yeah you know, and that's I, not my dis- that wouldn't have been my decision that was uh the company i worked for which was um Warner Brothers and Telepictures. That's the show that was we produced Crime Watch Daily. Um, that was, you know, that was their call. I think in that aspect, there's no money to be had. They're in bankruptcy. You know, there's, you know, and then if you do do that, it's a lengthy process to even get a penny. And then you know, those lawyers for years for that company have to, it would cost them more in legal, you know what I mean? Like it just, I, I just think they felt like, nope, this is what we, you know, we're, we're good here. So, okay, and there's we've gotten a couple more good, really good questions. How are you on time? Do you need to? Oh, okay, I'm okay. Okay, yeah. Um, do you think Amanda is so mentally ill that she's taking the success of the podcast and all the recognition as a win for her? Um, or- I don't know how much she knows in in prison. I don't think like they're sitting there all listening to it. I'm sure people are telling her there's there's stuff or or whoever, maybe obviously her husband. Um, we reached out to them to get, you know, comment or, you know, reaction and, you know, forward, because you, that's how you do stuff when you, when you are going to air something. Um, and, you know, never, there was none of that. I know Charlie, uh, is in contact with her in some capacity, emailing it through the prison system. Um, you know, yeah, I'm sure she's, you know, maybe she loves it. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know in prison, do other prisoners look at her like, Oh wow, that's what you're in here for. That's really hor- horrific, right? So Can I don't I think they're high fiving her. Like, yay, one, good way for way to go. I did 
1,000 deaths when Charlie said that she had contacted Amanda after sentencing about, and mentioned something about doing like a docu-series, or I want to ask you about that as well, um, about doing some kind of a doc documentary about Amanda. And Amanda goes, you know, my story has never really been told <laughs> from my perspective. And I'm like, okay, she did that a lot, how she says that. And I'm like, what the F are you talking yeah. about? Your well, perspective she said that all the time. Yeah, she said that all the time, you know, just so it was, you know, desperately like, well, I don't want to use the word desperately, but, you know, trying to talk and understand um, for a long time and, you know, asking like, I, please, like you did this, like this is, ter and, you know, they would say things to her like, you're not a victim. Why are you, why are you paying attention to court? You shouldn't be in court. You're not a victim. It's like, there's no, um, they see both of them see no connection to why jessa would ever be a victim which is uh, mind-boggling uh, yes and the amount of time she uses language like i'm a nobody my little old blog um i didn't ask for the spotlight i agree she says i agreed to do this and it's like who's paying you for this blog nobody yeah. you're your own you're yeah. putting out because you want to <laughs> like i just that drive me nuts yes yeah, yeah. Um, did the church ever make a statement publicly regarding Amanda? Ooh, no, cool. and you know, uh, the church. So when we did the, when we were at the serving of the, the search warrant, um, myself and at the time, Anna Garcia, who's a True Crime Daily host. Um, Such a good talking voice, by the way. <laughs> like, right? yeah. uh, we worked together and uh, at Crime Watch. So um, she was with me for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, after that, we went over to the church mm -hmm. and uh, there were a few people around. We left our cards, we left our information. I followed up with emails um, and and I was told, you know, basically, I, I forget the term that the pastor um, used, but basically, you know, it's like a, a attorney client privilege, but with a pastoral that he really couldn't say anything or talk about it and whatever. I know he, I know they um, was some, you know, talked with uh, Detective Martinez. I'm sure they talked with uh, Agent Lee at some point, uh, since they did give so much money over the over the years. Um, I will say that um, Corey's family attorney is the head pastor's daughter. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sharice Fisher was his representation in court. So when Alita would, and her attorney Jenny, would finally went to the court, to be like, hey, there's this investigation. Hey, she's lying, you know, or these things aren't right. This isn't true. Um, and you're making all these accommodations for Corey and blah, 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 and the money and all of this. Um, so she knew, you know, so, so Sharice or the, would have known about it from, you know, 2015 when, when it came to light. And so, you know, there's this connection to Corey, to the church. Like it just, I think it was on, a lot of people's radars and no one really knew how to handle it yes did they continue to fundraise after yeah yeah and that at first it was very hard to watch that you know because i'm i know they're being investigated i've you know tried to put it out there to kind of hey you know this is what i'm looking into um and even after detective martinez went there in, in uh, like September of 2015. Um, they did some of their biggest fundraising after that. Jeez. Yeah. Um, did you, have you heard, so like, well, I mean, I'll just say my, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of my mom, but she is very like messed up from this encounter. I think it's hard for her to trust her own judgment. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, as I, the last episode I liked, people being like, oh, like hearing it. And then like, once they actually get sunk in, you know, she was faking it. And I, I realized what was so profound about it is that they experienced her having cancer. It wasn't just that they read the yeah. blog, like she made people experience it with her. You know, she passed out in Peter Pants at church and everybody was praying for her. So she involved emotion, fear, faith, um, witnessing it with their own eyes. You know, it wasn't just people reading about it. They lived her cancer experience. So when they're finding out that she was faking it, it's like 
they can't trust themselves because they experienced her having cancer. Like people would say, yeah. I saw her in the hospital. I visited her in the hospital. Like, how is that? And, not and that is something I that, yeah, that is something that I keep, you know, people keep asking, or I know in the comments, like, but she's been in the hospital and, and yes, I mean, she was able to get herself admitted. Um, my understanding and, and people that it was always, you know, heart issue, lung issue. Again, there are things that you, you know, it, it sounds like, well, no, that doesn't work that way, but it's a, it's not hard to go through an emergency room. It's just not, it, it, I, 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 she did it all the time. Um, and then, you know, and they check you out and they treat you and they, you know, well, my head, my this, you know, migraines, whatever. Um, she was able to do that quite a bit. Uh, I do think it was not as easy to get herself admitted. You know, she would say, I've been in the hospital for 70 days. No, you aren't. No, you haven't. Um, it's smoke and mirrors at that point. And so I think she would then go back through the emergency room and then, oh, oh, come visit me this weekend. I've been transferred. It was always like, I've been transferred. I'm in a special unit. I'm there was a lot of wordplay that went around her movements. And, you know, I know they had, they had Kaiser for insurance because we know this because that's um, how Jesso had her insurance and that is submitted to the courts. Um, but yet she was n never there hospitalized. She was always somewhere else. In Gilroy, there's, you know, different ones. And in, in San Francisco, there's a million to choose from. Like, so she was all over the place <laughs> except where she you know so it makes sense for trying to get drugs yeah. refilled a and b because just recently now we have a system where we can check when you've filled narcotics but before no. we didn't especially around that time there was no, no. cure system it was just like if you weren't in that system they wouldn't know uh, but specifically we've had this problem because you know we're stanford our patients go to good samaritan hospital right down the road and we do not share a yeah. computer right so have to manually request request the records and i could so see her you know even just the church experience peeing her pants mm -hmm. passing out going by ambulance to you know let's say good sam or wherever then they're saying i have lymphoma and then let's just pretend that she you know was in the er taking all these pictures and then she just puts herself on the floor and pees on the floor and then when people come you know that's like a medical emergency yeah. and then she said, and then, oh, I don't know what happened. I just, you know, like I had a seizure or passed out. Then of course they would admit yeah. you. They would never send you home. And, like, and, and I think it's funny. You, you keep bringing up the pee on the floor. Like that was her go-to, which is a very bizarre thing. And it was always like, you know, at the church, it was, I got hot. I went for water. She, she didn't pee her pants. I mean, like, come on. She had water and but she could used water. Pee. Yeah, you, you just don't pee on cue all the time. I mean, she would talk about how she at work, she fell down, Peter Pan, like she and she was very proud about blogging that it, you know, so again, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors of, of what you, you, you think you're witnessing and you know, because you, you know, and keep so. on Reddit, we're talking about like, oh, her, you know, maybe she was at a med spa and getting like a- Someone says that they can pee, pee, I guess they can pee on pee. Well, good, that's good. That's interesting. I, totally, <laughs> I actually have a great story about um, peeing my pants, but it was water, but I tricked a lot of people into thinking I peed my pants on a bus once in high school. Um, we'll talk about that another time. But I really, I mean, if it was for like a hundred grand, I could totally pee on myself at church. No problem. <laughs> uh, like, definitely. Um, but she, though, so like her, she could have gone to a med spa and been getting like a vitamin C infusion or something and taking pictures of her IVs. And yeah, IV absolutely. Bag and, you know, and like I, think that, see, I think, I believe my opinion is that's what she said, Rebecca, like, because when she was going back and forth with Rebecca, it was after she was indicted and it was her way of trying to prove to her, like, no, I really have this. And, and it was funny because when I saw that, one of the things I researched was like, okay, where could you get IVs? And there was a place in Gilroy. And funny enough, <laughs> there was a um, uh, review on the one that was in, in Gilroy that kind of matched some of the information I had from, from Rebecca. And uh, there was a review left by Mandy, Mandy R. And she went by Mandy with all her family and friends. They called her. Oh, Mandy. no way. Yeah. And I was just, it's like, Dr. So-and-so is great. I've never felt better. You know, I was laughing. I was like, well, there you go. Oh my God. <laughs> so.
Um, but I will say, I mean, we can talk about, cause you sent me Rebecca, the screenshots on the podcast in the season finale, Rebecca is talking and she says like CCSB, he, she calls it he, me, onk, but it's he, monk, RN. And I was like, that is where I work. Amanda mm -hmm. is saying she came to my work and then you sent me the screenshot mm -hmm. and because and because Re Rebecca was saying on the podcast, she says, and there was a nurse and I looked her up and she has a LinkedIn and I was like, OMG, like what nurse is this? I work with them. And so when you sent it to me, I about peed my own pants mm -hmm. because she is claiming that one of my best friends, Sarah, was the nurse that gave her this chemo and the, of all perfection. I happen to know that Sarah does work with me. She does not give long chemotherapy infusions. She only has ever given very short, like less than 15 minute basically infusions. So there is no chance that she had chemotherapy mm -hmm. being given to her by Sarah at the time that she says she was. So I don't know yeah. anything about the appointment, but I was like, it looks legit. She has, you know, what, she, what she's sending is an appointment from the cancer center. It looks again, just to say like, I only would know that that was fake because I personally you know her right and know about her job, you know, specifics, but yeah. otherwise it looked totally legit. Like if I was Rebecca, I would definitely be duped. Like yeah. I don't really. <laughs> oh, so, so when did, Re when did Rebecca know that she, that she really wasn't, didn't have cancer? I think, um, and I think she talked about it in the podcast too. It was, once she got the Department of Justice letter, like she was still like, this can't be so and was really, um, it was when she went back and forth, I believe with Peggy, and then a little bit more with Amanda, where Amanda was really weaving some crazy detail about, you know, it's the, the I just didn't pay my tax type of tax type genius. of thing. But remember, That's genius again, yeah, genius. <laughs> and, and everything is, you know, the ex wife and my fault. So, but you know, with that, I don't think Amanda realized, you know, the emails and the information that the Department of Justice sent out to the victims, right? Because it was very detailed that it is a fraud. She never had cancer. Like they give you the information, right? So um, I think that's when she kind of could balance, balance it out. But she really does. Um, so one of my favorite things that she did was this, um, you had showed me, we can't share it per se, but her resume and she says i received the parthenon award of excellence mm -hmm. given to one student every five years by the president of san jose state university which is like oh crap that's like a really high honor but she does have what she brought to court i think we've realized that she did receive an award it just wasn't that award but like you could confront her with that lie and she could she could probably talk you into believing that possibly it happened you know like yeah yeah well with that, it was interesting because it was a real sticking point for her in court. Like she was really offended. Well, first she didn't realize we had all her, had subpoenaed all her work records because one of the things she claimed was that I got her fired. It was, I, I was, you know, doing stuff to do it. Um, and so we had to pr prove that that wasn't the case. So we subpoenaed her, 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 she, like a personnel file, which clearly showed they let her go because she wasn't coming in. She was sick and she was not there and they, needed to teach, to teach coverage and you know it's all spelled out there's emails there's a lot of documentation that was done through the school um and they asked her to you know to resign over never being there well, so but in it, that in her resume they wrote like everything yes. that was fine so, yeah and then they um went through and fact checked her resume and then really built what they felt was you know her not being truthful in everything when she applied for the job um, you know, she claimed to be enrolled at, at San Jose State and in the master's program and they they got her transcripts where she had all, all F's. So that was not possible. She did not have the credentials she told them she had. She was supposed to be involved in the provisional credentialing, um, what have you. And, and, and in here, it's like there's no, they, they note there's no, you know, they couldn't verify that. So, you know, they did the they they did the 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 legwork to figure out like okay this this is a problem and one of the things that they checked was this award that she wrote all about in her cover letter and stuff and and so she had got like a housing award which is called like the the Parthenon housing award but it has nothing to do with um, <laughs> 
with the five-year prestigious award that's given out, which is a big deal. <laughs> so, you know, she just, again, it's just a manipulated lie to make it look like, you they know. did say that, was it Kendrick who also got the part? Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, when on one of the bonus episodes, we spoke to Lennon, okay. and that was one of the things we brought up because I was always curious because she showed up in court and wanted to like show the judge the award, which was just so strange to me. Um, and uh, he said, wait, is it a clock? Did it have, I said, yeah, you know, and, and he's like, I got that too. I got it the same time she did. They give that out. <laughs> so it, it's not every five years. It's not special. She's not special, right? She's not. But she writes up explicitly. Yeah. I received it. It's given to one student every five years by the president. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my yeah. gosh. You and I thought for sure she went to a trophy shop and had that made. I did too. <laughs> I, I did too. So Lennon, you know, when he said that, I went, oh, okay. And, but now, now I see, you know. Is what? she a genius? Like stuff like that. <laughs> Did you just get lucky or like, how does she do that? Uh, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's not genius. It's, um, evil it's by diabolical, right? It's, it's, there's no, there's no off switch to, to like ground yourself to realize you, you shouldn't be doing this to people. Yeah. I think you, you know, earlier uh, you and I went over these questions, make sure they were all okay to talk about which they were. But um, we, we were talking about, you know, is she a narcissist? Is she a sociopath? And you were just like, whatever it is, she's evil. Like, she knows it's wrong. It doesn't matter. Like, and nobody can diagnose her from hearing about things. But, like, it's wrong what she was doing. And she knows it. And so, it, yeah. like, it doesn't matter. It's just, like, she was doing yeah. something. And, and, and as, in, you know, in the... As we read the judge's statement, you know, she takes no accountability. Oh, I loved the judge's statement. Yeah. I was because you hear Amanda, like in the actress who the voice actress who did Amanda in the podcast was so good. Yeah, you really got the, <laughs> her talking and Amanda talking. And when she reads Amanda's statement, I was really like, oh my gosh, she is saying everything right. She just really like did a good job writing, you know, her speech. And then I loved that the that the judge was like, I can only imagine how good you were at getting right. people to believe you had cancer with yeah. how and well, the, yeah. Each the, judge, the judge did a phenomenal job and had her nailed. And, you know, that we, we, we shared the majority of the judge's statement, but what um, I think one of the things that really put things over the top for the judge was that, you know, Lisa and Steve Barry were there and um, read an impact statement that, you know, to make sure the judge knew that they, had come across her two years prior and Lisa did a phenomenal job explaining to the judge like I you know she told me this she told me this and then this was two years before you know made it very point and the judge when she continued with her statement said we know now from Lisa and and Steve Barry that um you you didn't learn your lesson then and so I need to give you more time so their statement I think really put uh the judge over you know over the top of of and because that's when the judge said i'm going to go above sentencing what what the what the what they're asking um so you know that was you know was really, really important and I, I think another thing just to go back to how diabolical or how you know her thought process or her inquiry from that fact that's my opinion um you know steve lisa's Lisa's husband had lost his first wife to cancer. Mm. And when that culmination of um, them being, you know, no, her telling her about a fundraiser for this other gentleman and Corey knowing that Lisa, that Steve lost his first wife uh, to cancer, they did not miss a beat and an opportunity to then all of a sudden, oh, you know, Steve, my, my wife has four months to live. Like, who does that? And that was two years prior. So there's your other question about Corey, right? What, so what happened? She got cured and then two years later she got re-diagnosed. I mean, what are we what are we talking about? You know? And to do that to a friend, I mean, Steve stood up for him at his with their at their wedding, and to then bring that out of them, you know, uh, that Wait, you but know, Steve stood up yeah, for Corey at his yeah, wedding? Steve was Steve was in Corey's wedding. You know, they they were they were friends, right? They were all friends for this time period before, you know, Lisa was like, whoa, you know, they there was a lot of struggle with trying to figure you know that stuff out. And so yeah, they did that to 
he did that to a man that lost his wife uh, and knew what that would put him through. Okay, I know yeah. we're so over on That's time, okay. but I have I, I, but, I, <laughs> quick questions. Of all the, because you have like such a unique, you know, inside knowledge of this. Um, of all the people you talked to, did you really feel like people are like burned and messed up from what she's done to them? Do you feel like they're moving on? Um, do you feel like they're not, you know, doing good in the community because she's made them very hesitant to donate money? Like how are people, how are her victims like doing now basically? You know, a lot of them have a lot of faith in just people in general. So I think that's something they hold on to, you know, really well. And they don't want to not be as gracious and be as helpful if the, if the situation arises again with someone. Nobody wants to ever think that you're just going to not be there for, for someone, you know, down the road. Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, maybe a little more skeptical. And they've said, like, I, I, my radar's up a little bit more. And, I mean, I know you don't. It's no fun to live like that, but it, you know, honestly, it's just in the day and age we are living in, with the ability to so easily donate and and put things out there online and um, with social media, I, I you know, I, I I do know that they're thinking twice, but not 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 having faith anymore because I think you know they don't nobody wants to live like that, and most every you know everyone is like it's not the money, it's the torment and the emotions that they went through. Yeah, like, and not trusting yourself that you... Yeah, that you could have, yeah. Um, yes, gosh, so much. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> um, yes. Tell us what's next for you. Is there a docu-series coming? Is there a movie coming? Like, what are you working on? What's next for um, Samantha? Um, that's the hope. I mean, you know, I am, I'm a television producer, you know, doing a podcast when I talked to Charlie when we first kind of got together and, and talked about this, you know, podcasts are new for me. It's not something that I, that, that that's my, my, you know, strong suit. So that's, you know, that's why this is, you know, Charlie took the, to the lead on this and, and, you know, I worked with her to, to bring in the, bring in the people that I've known for all these years and, and the documents and the blog, you know, all of that type of stuff. And then she, um, Charlie has a really unique way of getting to the emotion and really getting you in that moment and that journey. And that was kind of what this podcast was about to be like, here's the journey, go on it with us, learn about what this is. And then um, the hope is, you know, to be able to do more of a docu-series, which is my strength and my, um, you know, I've, I've always followed up and covered this story for TV. So I have a lot of assets over the years, um, videos of her and you know the, the blog and a lot of people were like where's the blog i can't find anything yeah you know she she took that down you know i think when she was indicted or before that when, in one of the re remission processes she kind of shut everything down because she knew she was going to have a problem right so um it wasn't scrubbed by the feds it wasn't like you know it's something she's in control with she shut down all her social media and for at least for a little bit when she reappeared in texas um she moved to Facebook more and she was in and out of hospitals there and really, um, and that was while she was indicted, which is crazy to me, but. Are you and Charlie best friends? Where does she live? Do you see? <laughs> no, I mean, this is the first time I've worked with Charlie and um, I, I, you know, we came in contact with her through um, a, a longtime colleague that um, I'm working on to do, you know, to hopefully do the docuseries and with that, um, I was introduced to Charlie and, you know, told her about, you know, we were talking about it and stuff. She's like, oh, we should really, can we do a part? Like what? And so um, we kind of joined forces for that. And uh, that's kind of how it all came to be. And um, I think, uh, you know, I'm really just glad we did it, you know, that she, she was so interested in to do it. And I think it's the type of story for me, you know, federal cases or scam cases are really difficult to tell on television because there's not usually there's not a lot of assets and a lot of it's paperwork right it's bankruptcy court records uh family court that's not that's not you know sexy for tv right so you know they, it takes a lot more you, you need everyone to appear on camera you need to have visuals you need so you know i've i've spent all these years building that and so um that's the hope oh my gosh uh, so much of it <laughs> as imagery like 
I just have the per I can already see the scene where she's like coming up from the water with the tiny <laughs> band-aid behind her. Like, oh, I just said my brain fluid drained. Like I, I think it did such a good story of just visually I was right there. Well, with you, you know, like, and and to that, um, you know, my my approach and my my hope, it's not, you know, what Alita and Jessa went through to me is the crux of everything. I mean, that it, to me is just the, the, the worst cross to bear and that that dynamic. That, that said, um, you know, being a part of their family, like I'm very, I'm very close with them. I have a tremendous respect for how Alita handled things and um, got through all of this. And, you know, Jessa, grew up, I mean, I, I feel like Jessa grew up with me now and, and the relationship we have also with Lisa, Lisa's very close to Alita and Jessa now. And, and so there's a lot of things that have come out of it that I think um, can be addressed and be, be part of a docu-series that you don't get just from this, right? The, the relationships, the bond, um, you know, Alita and Lisa as, you know, while I was researching this, they were really instrumental. I would say, you know, hey, when you knew her back then, did you know X, Y, like, so they had information up here that really helped me be able to solidify and, and keep logging facts and, and fact checking things. And so it, it wasn't just me. I mean, uh, in, in that aspect. And then I, you know, I had a team of people I worked with that were very helpful. And you, you t start, started to say, but there are lessons to be learned here. I think it's still unfolding what can be learned, but like in terms of the church addressing it, like, please, if anybody <laughs> from FCC is on here, like, we want as a christian like i want to hear what what you think what we should think how we should process what happened um I, I do think there's something to learn or at least um how to get through this as a group and how so they're not deterred in the future like they, you still they still want to be able to give and to give their hearts and do all all of that and i think you know that's there's uh the pastors can really help get them through that and maybe talk about it more I, do, I don't know i don't know what's going on behind the scenes i know that that church a lot of the the lead things have changed as different people aren't there anymore and some are so i know uh pastor chase has moved on he's at a different uh, uh church now and stuff too so you know i'm sure they're all, all kind of making their way through it and, and trying to figure out how do you come out the other end of it yes and and I think just people wanting to connect in that, like there's shared trauma, certainly within FCC, within Valley, within the community. And like, we need people to step up to lead these discussions on how to move forward, how to regain trust in ourselves and one another. Like, I mean, she basically left a tornado of wake. And I think the wrong thing to do is to feel shame about it and and will not discuss it because i think so much good can come from it and i think there's honestly lessons to be learned from just how she handled herself like the amount of support that she got between meals babysitting money cash like a lot of us know somebody who's going through cancer and so often the case is that they don't get that, any yeah. kind of support they're suffering but what i, what, what I wouldn't want i see someone comment like the idea that because of what she's done, you know, a, ca a, a true cancer patient or survivor or someone going through it would feel like they can't speak up or, or own their, their, their truth and what they're going through. Like, I would never want someone to feel that way, but I, I'm sure there's people that are afraid to ever speak up because of someone like her or, you know, may not get the resources that she diverted away. You know, it's, it's a, it's a horrible, feeling or thought process but it is it is you know unfortunately it's a reality we all have to kind of you know but i think we can learn something from her in you know if we are all suffering or have a need like sharing it with our community and watching people because i've learned this so much that people want to do good they yeah. they have you know maybe some extra money some extra time they want to to have an opportunity to do something good but it's not like presented to us very often in our everyday lives so she what she did was she was great at presenting people with opportunities to do good and so i think we can all you know learn something from that and being specific i need help with this i'm feeling this way here's a need i have can anybody fill mm -hmm. it 
Like, and I just think that what people are, you know, in general, I'm the same way. I'm like, oh, I could probably figure, I'm just going to figure it out myself or like I'll suffer through it. But she was very good about being specific in her needs. And I think we can all, you know, take a lesson from that. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. And, and you did get the community together. You know, people did a lot of people, good. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is something that came out of it to see a community rally behind and do what naturally would be the, the right thing to do. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Honestly, you, I, you're my hero. I have no, I'm, I'm just always like, damn, Nancy is in it for the long game. Like, how <laughs> are you? Yeah. I would be like, I would have, have pulled out all of my hair by now from waiting so long to see justice. Are you like, does it feel good where you're at now? You're like, okay, she's in prison. I have been exonerated. <laughs> like, yeah i mean you know back together with their mom yeah. like does it yeah feel it's it's a great it is a great feeling that um that justice was served and and honestly for for alita and jessa it's you know they're validated you know the it it was really important to them to kind of have something out there i know for jessa um she does not she's not in contact with her brothers and that's an extremely difficult thing and so she really wanted something out there to say you know to someday if as horrific as it is it's her way to say you know this is why you don't have contact with me you know and and not it's not by Jess's choice you know um she that she did something else that amanda was really terrible is that she used her children to, to manipulate <laughs> yeah yes it, and she like you guys don't talk about it on the podcast but both my my mom and my husband were remembering that she would give gifts a lot to people like she would like unnecessary crafts and gifts she would forget yeah. bring it yeah she you know she put herself out there as a very generous very kind person and she got back that in in you know endless amounts so you know but I will say there's one more bonus episode Monday, Ooh. Um, which kind of flips that her that that charming side of her on her head. You know, when she it's it is um, it is all about her time at uh, the the uh, pack point uh, mm -hmm. when she was principal, um, and it is a person that dealt with her there and what she put that that community through. Um, it's a it's a lot of information and i think it's one that it, again you know the the feds had a time frame that they charged with and what they concentrated on because that's what had been committed at the time um and then she continued and so she became principal took the money from miss cindy all of that is not included in the charges that you see so anything she took from those parents that school um, what she did to those teachers, she made life a living hell there. So, um, and, and, and you'll have someone talking this, you know, this is stuff that uh, I, you know, had been in contact with various people there, but again, the, the, the focus is on what they were able to charge her with. So um, it's really eye opening. So that, that charming personality disappeared. So yeah and again like it's so much more than the scam what she did all the emotional yeah terrorism that she wreaked is just insane but mm -hmm. um thank you for the podcast i love it everybody that i've told about it is like oh my gosh this is so good um it's really a story that is riveting and, and it's just so, so many and there's you know i hate to say there there is so much more that she did <laughs> that that's the hope and and I hope to be able to to you know share that as we go along so that's that's we'll see well, thank <laughs> you love you Nancy you're well incredible. thanks for having me this is great and you're stopping your from mom. damaging so many more people you know I know that you worked really hard to yeah. to get the word out and to help her, stop her so thank you for yeah. stopping you, my pleasure <laughs> see you on Monday can't wait okay for the enjoy give us that docu series, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that, that would be great. <laughs> Take care. Thanks so much. Bye bye.